If salvaging people in their needs in the main objective, then Borno State Government can be described as the master of the act. Long before the withdrawal of subsidy of premium motor spirit that triggered the current national clamor for palliatives, Borno State has been doling out various kinds of palliatives to alleviate the suffering of the people ravaged by insurgency. But no state template of palliative is the focus on panorama this afternoon. Welcome to my degree. I am Lady Musa. <laughs> President Bolatin Ibu says the current challenges facing the nation are only temporary, assuring Nigerians that better days are in the offing. President Tinibu said this during an audience with delegation of Southwest Muslim leaders led by Al Haji Razaki Oladejo at the State House, while promising to do his best for the economy to get better for the benefit of the citizens. The president said Nigerians have to believe in the country. The president noted that the policies and programs of his administration are aimed at achieving a fairer, better, and honest society where hard work is rewarded and where laziness reaps little. He, uh, he pointed out that in the history of successful nation, there is nothing more vital than the leadership of the nation taking difficult decisions at the right time and for the right reasons. The president declared that the subsidy regime was a huge hurdle that was leading the nation and subnationals to a situation where have had no money to work with. He commended the leaders of their prayers and support, assuring them that his administration is determined to empower the youth with skills and creates an enabling environment for them to prosper. The president of UMA, al Hajra Saiki Oladejo, in company of the Master of Marine and Blue Economy, Adeboye Oyetola, commended President Tinibu for his courage in removing the petroleum subsidy and initiating necessary, even if difficult, reforms. Vice President Kashim Shetima has arrived in the United States of America to participate in the AFDP World Food Prize facilitated Norman E. Bowledge International Dialogue stated for Iowa. In a statement by the Senior Special Assistant to the President, Media and Communications, Office of the Vice President Stanley Okocha, the Vice President as a special guest is due to deliver the keynote address at the event which comes on October 24, 2023. The Vice President, while in the United States of America, will be engaged in high-stake meeting across some states of the U.S. with manufacturers, investors, and top government officials. On the Norman E. Burlick International Dialogue, he will be joining the late former United States Secretary General and, G and AGRA founder, Kofi Annan, World Food Prize Laureate, Ghana President John Kofur, and AFDB President Akin Womi Adeshina, former President Olusegun Obasanjo, President Felix Shakirkaj, and Josukwe Jasano Joyce, Banda Amena Gurin, Fakin, and Ifad President Kanayo Wenze as distinguished African leaders who in the past have used the event to convey support for agricultural development for food sufficiency in Africa. The Vice President will use the platform to speak to the potentials and endowment of Nigerian agriculture sector, who investors and push for more commitments in achieving President Bola Ahmed Tinibu's mandate and programs for Nigerian agro-food sector. Addressing exchange rate management issues, poverty, inflation, and unemployment requires the consideration and approval of the emergency economy intervention 
bill from the executive as a proposed legislation from the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms. This is part of a 28-point communique raised at the end of two-day retreats of the 10th National Assembly held in Uyu, Akwaibom State. Kelvin Samuel reports. The 28-point communique, among other issues, highlights the need for the legislative to work with the executive for the amendments of some obsolete national laws. It also brings to light the need for effective management of resources and review of the tax waiver policy, which is to serve as a template for the Senate to synergize with the executive to ensure tax harmonization. Facilitated by the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, participants were exposed to different aspects of legislation and critical areas that require urgent attention. I think the President is well advised with uh, all the submissions today, and we'll go back to the thinker with a lot to review what we need to review, and then set the right to assist you to generate more revenue for the help of the tender of this organization. This agreement should not be seen as an opening to score political points or triumph over one another, but as opportunities to rigorously contest the foundations of policy propositions, challenge assumptions, and improve the quality of the proposals we jointly implement on behalf of the people we are we serve. And it is when the economy is pinched on legislation that you truly have economic stability. Some participants say they are better equipped to deliver on their mandates. Is to ensure fiscal policy, tax reforms, and also ensure accountability and transparency. As leaders, we must make sure that the taxes being paid by the citizens you know, really count for them in what they can see, uh, so as they will be encouraged. Uh, some don't even pay at all. They ev evade um, uh, taxes. So, the, and the issues here have got to do with both the executive and the legislature. We have learned what to do. We're going to do just that. Nigerians will be better off. Our tax system will improve. Leakages will be blocked. The 28-point communique is expected to serve as a guide for the 10th Senate. In Uyo, Kevin Samuel, NTA News. The three-day conference for Assembly Service Commissions has ended with participants expressing concerns that delay in granting autonomy to state assemblies is affecting the quality of legislation in the country. The parliamentary commissions call on state governors yet to consider this autonomy to do so in the interest of Nigerian democracy. Ignatius Iko has details. In the last three days, the Mariam Babangida National Center for Women Development played host to more than 100 commissioners from the various parliamentary commissions across the country. It was a capacity-building conference for the improvement of parliamentary bureaucracies with the National Assembly Service Commission at the driver's seat. Deductions from submissions made by participants were summed up in an eight-point communique. The urgent need for state governors to end executive interference in the state legislative arm of government was conspicuously captured. That's why we are calling on the governors. Let them give autonomy to the uh, national state assemblies and by extension to the state assembly commissions. That's all what we have been agitating for. Okay, okay. To be able to provide excellent services for the purpose of the development of our democracy. And I want advice those places that the particular state that uh, you know this uh, commission has been formed to ensure their self-autonomy, especially financial autonomy. The commissions resolved to establish a national council and establishment for the legislative arm of government that will ensure uniformity in code of ethics, appointments and promotions. And one of the things that we always do on the part of the National Assembly Service Commission is to make sure that we send, um, communicate, um, from this program to respective state governors and also the speakers of various houses of assembly around the country. So we believe that impacts should be immediate. The state are uh, faced with issues of funding and also middle some of uh, the leadership and also executives in the state. Uh, in, in the commissions in the state are supposed to operate as the engine room for the provision of 
a well articulated and professional bureaucracy for the assembly. 21 states were represented at this conference, with Yobe having the highest number of delegates. Ignatius, Inko, NTN News. Take a break. Panorama continues shortly. The Council of Our Fathers. I will urge and advise our younger generation to use talent and brain to sort out problems, not uh, arms. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation. My advice to these young people is please uh, do not take us back to those harrowing days. You probably do not know what it is. I believe we have fought one civil war too many in this country. So those who experience it will run away from it. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. Thanks for staying tuned. Over 120 million Naira cash, food and non-food items have been shared to over 40,000 families in Kondiga town of Borno State as the government continues its palliative support project to the people. Mohamed Goni reports that the distribution which took place in three centers was supervised by Governor Papa Gano Marisola. Beneficiaries of the palliative distribution comprise 15,000 male heads of households, each of whom received 25 kg bag of rice and 10 kg bag of beans. Borno State Government began distribution of palliatives targeting 300,000 households across the state with priorities on communities most affected by insurgency. The target beneficiaries were later scaled up to 400,000 households. We penciled down now there are 25,000 vulnerable women. Each will collect a raffle, 5,000 naira. Uh, that translates to 125 million naira and 125,000 raffles. Over 2,000 vulnerable families from the 27 wards of Mairuguri Metropolitan Council and Jerela Kergaman area have benefited from the palliative distribution, which have been steadily sustained by Governor Zilim, hence giving money, food and hope for the people. Besides food distribution, Governor Zilim introduced other measures including 80 free buses conveying farmers to and from their farms and 30 buses for subsidized transportation of civil servants to their offices and back home, as well as provision of subsidized metro city buses. In Maiduguri, Mohamed Goni, NTA News. Um, today on Panorama, we have Dr. Balikindo Mohammed, who will be drawing more light on palliative. Sir, you're welcome to Panorama this afternoon. We're glad to have you. Bruno State is widely described as home of palliatives. What informs this, sir? Yeah, actually, before we even uh, give the reason why uh, the palliative comes up, uh, it's good we have to, we, uh, we need to have the idea of the meaning of palliative. Okay. Palliative is a broad terminology from a medical term, uh, giving uh, a kind of uh, relief when a patient is uh, in severe condition and also when the medical doctors are trying to find out uh, uh, the best way to cure or to relieve him from the pains. So this is the actual meaning of palliative from the medical perspective. But uh, generally, palliative, if we say palliative, is uh, palliative comes when there is a, a situation or a circumstance that uh, the beneficiary of the palliative is in a critical condition. And for now in Nigeria, we can say almost everybody is, is feeling the impact of the withdrawal of fuel subsidy. Okay. So majority of the population are in critical condition, and that is why uh, the federal government of Nigeria under the leadership of uh, President Bola Ame Tinubu, Tinubu introduced uh, the uh, palliative uh, uh, to, the, to the country. So this is the meaning of palliative. And what informed palliative in Borno State, you know, even before the introduction of palliative in the, in the, uh, across the country in Borno State, uh, the executive governor have been distributing palliative uh, to the people as a result because you know Borno is the epicenter of Boko Haram. So many families were displaced, 
many property and uh, activities were distorted, destroyed, dismantled. So as a result of that, everybody is feeling the impact of the Boko Haram in the state. That is why uh, His Excellency, uh, the Executive Governor of Borno said, even during uh, His Excellency uh, Governor Kasho Shetima and the current governor uh, were distributing palliatives to the beneficiaries. So um, this is what uh, has been going in Borno State. Okay. So uh, what template does the state use in distribution of palliatives? Uh, in Borno State, um, actually, the palliative committee under the directors of His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Borno State, uh, Professor Babagana Omar Azulum, gave the instruction that at least let us try or let the committee try and see that those that are supposed to benefit, benefit from it. So the population or the people of Borno State were categorized into four categories. Those that can afford, that is we can say, uh, we can use this term, those that are buoyant, those that have the capacity mm. to get all what they need mm. are the first class of the people. Then the second class of people are those that have the opportunity, although they cannot afford to buy it, but they have the opportunity. Example like the civil servants, like maybe the, uh, the businessmen, uh, they are sure of getting something. To, um, even when they don't have it, they can get it. So uh, these are the second category or the second class of people. Then the third category of people are the poor people. Those that, when they go out that day, they can get something to feed their family. They are, they are poor. And then the last category is the vulnerable people. So these vulnerable people are uh, classified as the most indigent among the people. So the template Borno State uses is uh, starting from the uh, indigent or the vulnerable population. And when we say the indigent or the vulnerable population, somebody uh, can be, or can, can be uh, cannot be indigent but he's vulnerable. Example like uh, sick people, like all people, mm. like people with disability, uh, like um, widows, like a, a head of a, a female head of household, mm. all these are vulnerable population. Even if they are not indigent, they are vulnerable population. population. While others are the people that maybe uh, because of their economic status, they are very, very indigent. So this is the template. And the state government starts from the lowest level, that is the indigent or the vulnerable mm. class of population mm. moving upward. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in some places out of Brno, mm. uh, palliative do mostly arrive late and in sometimes too small in small quantities. How does Brno achieve it differently? Brno said achieve it. Um, I'm sure everybody knows across the country and even globally, everybody is applauding Professor Babagana Omar Zulum because of his benevolence be, uh, approach. Because he don't joke when he fee, when he notice that the population of the state are in critical condition. So out of his benevolence, mm -hmm. he pulled out resources to see that um, to see that everybody gets it. And then the second approach, or the reason why Bruno succeeded, is um, uh, the committee he inaugurated to take care of the palliative distribution at Trustworthy Committee. Everybody is trying to see that they have done. They, are, they, are, they have done what is supposed to be done. And they are very, very trustworthy. That is the committee of the palliative. And then the last one, we can say, even the governor himself participate in the distribution of the palliative in most of the times, in most of the communities. Wherever the palliative is being distributed, he will either go and flag it off and participate, or allow the committee to flag it off Okay, to start the, the distribution while the governor himself come to encourage everybody to do their best. So this is, uh, this is the, the, the approach that Borno adopted, and uh, that is why the palliative is very, very successful in Borno State, because a lot of resources were imputed, were in, invested in it, and also the committee uh, doing, were doing their best to see that they, uh, everybody gets it. So how is it done? Is it... Uh uh, within the metropolis and the local government? Is it done at the same time or one after the other? How is it done? Yeah, uh, we can say it is done concurrently uh, in some places, uh, but not across the state at one time, but it is being done. You know, <laughs> people cannot, uh, when, people is, uh, when, when somebody is hungry, he cannot wait for his turn. Yes. So actually we try to identify the vulnerable communities 
and then start giving them concurrently at that time. And that, that is how it does. Okay. Uh, tell us more about the non-components, the non-food components of the palliative. Okay. Yeah, the non-food components of the palliative, uh, we, when we go back to the actual definition of palliative, is trying to give somebody succor or trying to give somebody a kind of assurance that um, uh, try and find yourself at this position so that to enable you to, to, to jump up to a level that you can uh, take yourself out of your condition. So that is it if we go by the definition of the palliative. Um, the approach or the non-food components, yes. the non-food components, one, mm. psychologically, that is the governor himself, visit all these places, as I said earlier, mm. wherever. And once the people see the governor, they know that he has that feeling for them. So no matter how little is given to them, they try their best to see that they also utilize it to enable them to kick, to, to, to kick up and catch up with their economic and other livelihood activities. Then I'll also second, secondly, the governor includes everybody okay. during the palliative distribution. Okay. And also uh, during the palliatives, uh, most of the times, uh, especially during the solar period, the Christmas period, they try to see that all the vulnerable co co communities were also involved in it. Okay. So, and then lastly, we can say the other non-food components include like food, food and uh, the, like clothing, like sanitary uh, commodities, mm -hmm. and even the buses that the state government provides, at least is another form of palliative to enable them to kick up uh, and start their, their agricultural live livelihood activities. Yeah. Thank you so uh, very much, uh, Dr. Mekindi Wong. Thank you for coming on Parama this afternoon. We're glad to have you once again. Thank you very much. Uh, menstrual challenges girls face in schools is one area that is accorded less attention by stakeholders in the education system. A non-governmental organization is collaborating with the Burma State government to change the narrative in a manner that dignifies the girls' student. Jeffrey Joseph tells us more. Gathered in this hall are government representatives and civil society organizations, humanitarian partners as well as traditional leaders. In her remarks, the donor Aisha Tukabu is of the view that promoting menstrual health and hygiene is an important means for safeguarding women and girls' dignity and privacy, calling on government and other relevant stakeholders to address issues surrounding poverty periods. Once a girl faced with menstruation challenge or she stands in the class, she can actually go to any teacher within the school environment or especially to the garden and counseling unit to say that I need access to sanitary pad because I don't have it. Looking at their vulnerability, I think it's of very, very great importance and it is very, very key. Uh, what I urge for and crave for is the continuity and the sustainability the state government on its part says it has put all measures in place to provide a safe watch facility in schools across the state, adding that it does remain open for organizations and individuals who want to support the government in that direction. Panelists at a roundtable discussion suggested that when girls and women have good access to a safe and affordable sanitary materials to manage their menstruation, they would decrease the risks of contracting infection. In Medugri, Japari Joseph, NC News. Up next is, is Sport Update with Omoyemu Onubo. The annual general meeting of the Nigeria Volleyball Coaches Association ended in Abuja with a charge to the coaches to maintain international best practices via their integrity as the 2023-2024 Nigeria Volleyball Premier League set to commence. Without the coaches, and there's no players. If they are the ones that train the players. And uh, today I'm pleased that they've been able to develop the coaching. Without the federation, we cannot stand. It was a night of pomp and pageantry at the 2023 IBB International Golf and Country Club Abuja Ladies Close Golf Championship climaxed as Zuliat Baba Ahmed emerged the overall winner. Zuliat, an architect, rounded up the two days competition with 236 gross 
and a net score of 148 to outplay others to emerge the 2023 ladies close champion my intention was just to play the game and then i saw myself you know amongst the leaders and i was like okay let's go and play again today even though the sun dealt with us but we still you know endured and i'm happy that um, we won something it will be an understatement uh, if i say uh, everything went beyond my expectations in football the 2023-2024 Nigeria Premier Football League enters March the 4th this weekend with Niger Tornadoes claiming a hard fought 1 0 victory over Bayasa United in the only match for Saturday. Later on Sunday, the Southwest Derby headlines Sunday's action as the battle for supremacy takes center stage in Ikene, where Remo Stars host newcomers Sporting Lagos. Plateau United tackles Sunshine Stars in Joss, while Bendel Insurance play away to Gombe United. In England, Newcastle United were the biggest winners Saturday on March the 9th of the English Premier League. The Eddie House men walloped Crystal Palace 4-0 at St. James's Park to move to fifth place on the log. It all started at Anfield, where 10-man Everton suffered a 2-0 loss to Liverpool. The London derby between Arsenal and Chelsea ended in stalemate as Arsenal came from two goal down to draw Chelsea 2-2 at Stamford Bridge. On Sunday, Aston Villa will host West Ham United at the Villa Park in the only Premier League match of the day. With sports updates, Olale Kan Kila Jolu, NTA News. From the studios of NTA Medjugorje Center, do have a nice day.